Let's take a look at the process where a web browser fetches a page from the web server and look at exactly what's going on. So on the client computer, you have a browser running, and it's going to be talking to a back-end web server that includes a web server like Apache, um, PHP, file system, and a database. For our development, we're going to be having all of this on one machine, but conceptually there's no difference between having a separate client computer and a separate server computer. So in this configuration, the web server talks to PHP through something called the Common Gateway Interface, and that's basically a standard that lets the web server run applications written in a variety of different programming languages that return HTML to the web server. And uh, this works fine, but, uh, um, but every time you fetch a page, potentially it needs to fire off a PHP process, which has some overhead associated with it. And then the PHP um, module has to load the web page and process it and send the results back across a pipe. And then the web server returns the results. So there's a lot of overhead with this kind of architecture. And so one of the things they developed was the ability to actually integrate PHP as a module that runs inside the web server. So basically, PHP looks like a library of code that the web server can access directly. And this saves some of the overhead involved in running PHP, because instead of having to kick off a new process, the web server can talk directly to PHP, which is already running in the web server. So this is what we're doing in the XAMPP configuration. There's a mod PHP that's um, loaded into the web server that Apache uses to process PHP pages. So what happens when you actually go to fetch a page? Well, the user is going to enter a URL into the web browser or click on a link, and that causes a page request to be sent to the web server using hypertext transfer protocol. And Hypertext Transfer Pro Protocol is a text-based protocol, so it's really easy to understand what's being sent. And you can even pretend to be a web server by connecting to the web server directly using Telnet and sending page request headers to it. So let's actually look at what the request header looks like. So I'm going to hit F12 to access the debugger tools in Chrome. And then I'm going to click on the Network tab and make sure all is selected. And this is going to show all the traffic between my browser and the web server. And then I'm going to navigate to HTTP colon slash slash localhost CIS 195p week one main.php. So that's the page I wrote last week. And here's where the browser sent a request to the web server. So I'm going to click on this to get a little more detail. And we can take a look at what was actually sent. So if I go to this headers tab, you'll see that there's a request headers. And this is the actual text that the browser sent to the web server across a socket. And it includes the type of request, get the path on the web server that we wanted to fetch, CIS195P week 1 PHP, and then the protocol that the browser is using, Hypertext Transfer Protocol 1.1. It also includes the host name, which is just localhost here, and a variety of other settings that the web server knows how to interpret, and most of these are optional. And then what the browser sent, or what the web server sent back is these response headers, so it said Hypertext Transfer Protocol 1.1, status 200, which is OK. And there are different status numbers, like 404 you might have seen, which means that the web page wasn't found, and 503, and some other ones. But 200 means that it was OK. And it set back the date that the thing was fetched, information about the server that's running on the back end, um, that it's powered by PHP. Anytime you see an X dash field in a header, that means it's an experimental and you can basically ignore it. It sends back the length of the response, 
and some other settings like the content type. This is important, text HTML, and that it's Unicode UTF-8 format. So this response header and request header, those are the means that the protocol uses to determine what's being requested and what's being sent back. And then the actual response, which is sent in the body of the response, is the HTML for the page. There's also some cookies and some other stuff going on that we'll look at later. So going back to the web architecture, the browser sends the page request using hypertext transfer protocol to the web server. And this results in the web server fetching the page from the file system. So there's actually a main.php that's living on my C drive that the web server loads. And then it sends it over to the PHP module that's running in the web server for processing. And that's going to go through and find any PHP islands and resolve them. Now one thing you can do in PHP is you can actually have a PHP page that includes other PHP pages. And you might want to do this, for example, if you have a library of code that you want to have available to all the pages in your project. It could include a template for layout, or it could include some code for fetching stuff from a database or from other sources. Or you can read data files that are stored on the hard drive. So PHP may or may not go out to the file system and fetch additional content that's used to assemble the page. And then the PHP can also talk to a database. And part of XAMPP is a MySQL database that we'll be using later in this course. But it could also talk to a Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle or any number of other databases. So PHP can go out to the database and send a SQL command to the database. So SQL is structured query language, and we'll see that more later in the course as well. After the PHP module has fetched all the content, it assembles it into HTML, and then the web server sends that HTML response back to the browser. So we saw the hypertext transfer protocol response header, and we actually saw the HTML that was getting sent back. Now, included in this HTML may be references to style sheets, which are CSS pages, or JavaScript.js files. Um, could be a number of different things. And so the browser might actually send a new request over to the web server. So, for example, if the web page we sent back has a style sheet, then we might initiate a request to get that style sheet from the web server. And then the web server would fetch that style sheet off the file system. Since the style sheet is not a PHP page, it just gets sent back to the browser. And then the browser might also load a JavaScript file. Looks the same. So we send a request for the JavaScript file. We fetch the file from the file system we send the file back to the web server. Now, once the web server is actually running a page, there can be JavaScript on that page that causes the page to contact the web server as well. So the JavaScript can actually request content from the web server. And this could either be um, a static file, or usually it's going to be accessing a PHP page. So it's going to Treat that just like any other PHP request and send a response back. Now, the response could be binary data, or it could be HTML, or it could be JavaScript object notation for data being sent back. And we'll look at all of that later in the course as well. So when you have JavaScript that's running in the browser that fetches content from a web server asynchronously, that's called AJAX, for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So that's a basic overview of how all the parts fit together. Um, things get even more complicated when you're running PHP Storm, which has its own integrated web server, and the browser's talking to PHP Storm, and PHP Storm's talking to the browser, and PHP Storm is talking to the web server, and the PHP module is talking to PHP Storm through the debugger. Um, but this is enough for now, and sort of gives you an overview of what we'll be doing.